thanks for all coming. Uh, we're going to talk about Ralph Fair and early beginning history. My name is Leonard Herman. In uh, 1994, I wrote the very first history book about video games. And that's just a little aside. And the book's available on my table, which today is at the end of the hall. Now, when we talk about video game history, there's four names that always come up. Willie Higginbotham, Steve Russell, well, five names. Nolan Bushnell and Ted Downey, they go together, and uh, Ralph Baer. Willie Higginbotham worked at the Brookhaven National Laboratory in uh, 1958. That was a nuclear research center on Long Island, and they would conduct tours on weekends. And so to liven up the tours, he, I don't know how he wrote it, whatever, he put this t uh, tennis game on the oscilloscope for people to play. And it's called Tennis for Two. Uh, it was popular, but it never went anywhere. It was never meant to be marketed or anything. And basically, it was forgotten after a while. Next name is Steve Russell. Steve Russell was a student at MIT. Him and a bunch of uh, other students worked on his uh, PDP mini computer and they programmed a game called Space War. So this was the first, basically the first computer game. There were earlier ones that played tic-tac-toe, but this is the most complex one. And other people and other schools learned about this game. The game was sent to other schools, people played it. And one of the people who played it was Nolan Bushnell. During summers, Nolan Bushnell worked at, on, in carnivals, in arcades. And he got the idea to turn Space War into an arcade game. After he graduated from college, he worked for Ampex in California. Ampex is the company that invented videotape as an engineer. And he worked with another man named Ted Dabney. And the two of them talked about bringing uh, Space War to arcades. And we'll get back to them later. There'll be more about them. And the last name is Ralph Baer. Who, Ralph Baer was an engineer who invented the first home console, which was released in 1972 by Magnavox, and it's called the Odyssey. Now, Ralph Baer. He was born in Germany in 1922. He was Jewish, left Germany right before the Holocaust started, came to America. When he was 18, he took a course at the National Radio Institute. Uh, after he graduated, he had a few jobs working with radios, uh, building them, repairing them. Then he got drafted in the Army. After the Army in 1946, he attended the American Television Institute of Technology in Chicago. Does that still exist, Tim? Uh, no, <laughs> Under GI Bill. He graduated in 1948 with a degree in television engineering. He's one of the first people to ever have such a degree. And this is what his diploma looked like. 1956. He got a job with a company called Sanders in uh, New Hampshire. Sanders was a defense contractor. He was an engineer for them. Ten years later, in 1966, he was sitting at the Port Authority for, uh, bus terminal in New York, waiting for a colleague, and he suddenly got an idea how to make TVs interactive. So when he returned to New Hampshire, he wrote a five-page treatise, and you can barely see it here. That's the first page. And he presented it to his management at Sanders. And surprisingly, they forwarded him $2,000 to uh, work on it. And it's worth about $15,000 today, what they gave him. And what's surprising about it is because Sanders was a defense contractor, what are they going to do with TV games? But they let him work on it. Within the next two years, they made about seven prototypes. The first one on the left, all it did was generate spots on the screen that they could move around. But, uh, by 1968, this one here is called the brown box. 
brown box, could play TV games, uh, I'm sorry, tennis games. Uh, you can manip manipulate the ball to do different things. You can play handball, uh, about 20 games altogether. And that's what it looked like. A reproduction of it is at my table. And the games were, if you call them games, they were built into the machine. And by adjusting the buttons, he played different games. He also invented the light gun, which uh, attached to it. Inside, this is what the inside of the brown box looked like. It, they had chips at the time, but chips are very expensive, so they use what's called discrete components, off-the-shelf off the parts. They tried to find a buyer for it. Uh, Sanders had no experience trying to sell consumer products. So Ralph realized that basically the parts were the same as a TV, so why not try to sell it to a TV company? So they had a bunch of TV companies come in, GE looked at it, wasn't interested, Zenith wasn't interested, and finally Magnavox looked at it, they were interested, they licensed it. And in September 1972, it came out as the Magnavox Odyssey. And we'll get back to that. Now this came out in 1972, but a year earlier, Nolan and Ted released their home version of, uh, well not the home version, they released their arcade version of Space War, which they called Computer Space. It was a failure. Basically, it was in arcades with pinball machines. No one ever saw such uh, something like that before. And people found it too complex to play. So now we come to 1972, which was a pivotal year in video game history. In early May, Magnavox toured the country with the new products that are coming out that fall. And one of the products was the Magnavox Odyssey. Now, Nolan Bushnell heard about it. He thought he was the only one who was doing video games, so he went to, oh, I'm sorry, on May 24th, they went to Burlingame, California to display their stuff. So Nolan Bushnell heard about it. He wanted to see what it was. And they have proof that Nolan Bushnell was there because he signed the book, the guest book. So anyway, the next pivotal thing that happened in 1972 was the incorporation of Atari on 1927. This was a company that Ted, Dabney, and Nolan Bushnell co-founded to produce video games. One of the first employees for Atari was a man called Al Alcorn. He had worked with uh, Ted and Nolan at uh, Ampex, so they brought him over. Now, Nolan wanted Al to produce a racing game, a video racing game, but Al didn't have any experience creating video games. So Nolan had seen the, Brown, uh, the Odyssey in Burlingame, and he saw it play uh, video game tennis. And even though he thought that it was a failure, he told Al to do a tennis game. So Al worked on a tennis game. Meanwhile, in September 1972, Magnavox released the Odyssey. It cost uh, $100, it was, and, but it was a failure as well. One of the reasons it was a failure is because Magnavox only sold it in their own stores. You couldn't go into Sears and buy it, couldn't go into Macy's and buy it, you had to go to a Bangalore store. It had a $100 price tag, which today is about $584. The salesmen at the Magnavox stores, not all of them, but a lot of them told customers that it would only work on Magnavox TV sets, so people would buy Magnavox TV sets. And finally, there were additional cards that could be added to the game and they're always hidden behind counters, so they didn't push it to say that the Magnavox uh, was upgradable. And then about two months after the Magnavox was released, Pong came out. Now Pong was a big success in arcades. And one of the reasons it was a big success where computer space hadn't been was because it was easy to play. The instructions were, were really avoid missing ball for high score. So Pong was this huge success, 
And that success went over to the, uh, to the Odyssey because basically that was the only way you could play Pong at home was by buying an Odyssey. But actually, the two were not the same. Graphics on the left is the Odyssey screenshot, the one on the right is the Pong screenshot. One difference is the paddles. The Odyssey had segmented paddles where, depending where you hit the paddle, the angle of the ball would sharpen. If you hit the ball, uh, the, pad, the ball on the end of the paddle, it would be a really sharp angle. If you hit it in the center, it would just go straight back. The Odyssey had these big block things, but you can move them anywhere on the screen where the uh, Pong could only be moved up and down. The Odyssey has something called the English switch, where you can move the paddle vertically, you can move it horizontally, but as the ball's moving in a straight line, you, you use your English, it will just give it a curve, so you don't know, the person playing wouldn't know where it was. So that's one of the different the English, which I just said. Number of players, Pong could be played by one or two players, where Odyssey had to be played by two players. Scoring, Pong had score on there, where Odyssey could couldn't keep score, you had to keep score yourself. And finally, sound. Odyssey had no sound. Pong had a Pong sound, where it got its name. So every time the ball hit the paddle, you hear something like that. So, but Magnavox sold a lot of Odysseys because of Pong. The only problem with uh, that was Odyssey contained a lot of parts, which made it costly. You, it couldn't generate graphics, so what they did was they came out with these overlays for different games. For each game, there were two overlays, one for a 25-inch TV, one for a 19-inch TV. There's chips, there's six of these cards which changed the game. If you remember the brown box, it had buttons to set. This used cards. And another reason it was costly to make was because it, used, it also used discrete components, off-the-shelf uh, uh, components. Now we come to 1975. Magnavox realized they couldn't keep selling Odyssey as it was because it was too expensive, so they chips have, the price of chips have come down, so they licensed Texas Instrument to create chips for, for them. So they came out with two systems, the Magnavox Odyssey 100 and the Magnavox Odyssey 200. The 100 contained two chips, and it played some of the games that were on the Odyssey, exactly as they were on the Odyssey. So you could play tennis, you could play handball. You didn't, these games didn't require graphics, so there were no overlays. Still, sorry. It still had the English switch, and it still couldn't keep score, so that had these nine little scores thing. 200 had four Texas Instrument chips and added an extra game. Meanwhile, the same year, Atari came out with a home version of POM. Uh, it was sold only at Sears for the first year, but it was basically the home version. Everything that was in the arcade version was in the home version. Then the same year, a company called General Instruments in Long Island produced a chip called the AY38500. This game had four paddle games built in, and this chip had four paddle games built in, and two shooting games. Now, Ralph Baer, because he, you know, they licensed, because Sanders licensed these games, Ralph Baer was made aware of this chip, and he, he liked it. And he saw a future in games with this. And of course, he was disappointed now with Mag how Magnavox was uh, marketing the Odyssey. He went to Coleco. He knew the president of Coleco, and he told the president of Coleco, you've got to go to Long Island, you've got to look at these chips, and you've got to use them. So the president of Long Island listened to him, bought as many chips as possible, and they came out with the Coleco Telstar. Now, before Telstar could come out, it ran into problems. FCC would not give it uh, certification because there was too much uh, radiation coming from it. So they told uh, Coleco, you have until the end of the week to fix this problem or else you're going to have to go to the end of the line, start, because they have other stuff they have to check. So Coleco went to Ralph to check for uh, 
RFI, and Ralph worked on it for two days, couldn't figure it out. Then work, uh, Ralph was fiddling in his lab, and he's looking in the cabinets, and he came across this ferret tor toro toroid, which is a powered iron ring that has certain electromagnetic characters when used at high frequencies. I'm not an engineer, I have no idea what that means. But if you wrap the, the uh, wires to the machine around that, it will shield the radiation. So Ralph tried it, solved the problem, like at the 11th hour. So Coleco went ahead, sold the uh, Telstar, made lots of money. Also, General Instrument, because uh, they suffered a chip shortage at the same time. So everybody else who ordered the chips didn't get them. Coleco was the only one who got their chips. So Ralph worked with Coleco and came up with some more consoles. 1977, they had the Telstar Alpha, used the same chip. It was basically a smaller model of the Telstar. It was cheaper, but it had the same games. It had one additional game, Highlight. They also came out with the Telstar Combat, which used a different chip, the 8700, and this was tank games. And finally, they came out with the Telstar Arcade. This had chips built into the cartridge, they used cartridges, which came out earlier this year, earlier that year. Actually, the cartridges came out in 1976, I'm sorry. Uh, what was unique about this system, it was built like a pyramid, three sides. One side had the Pong games, one side had the Target games, and for the first time ever, the console had uh, racing games, steering wheel and a ship. Ralph worked, uh, a few years later, Ralph came up with an idea to take a standard tape recorder and hook it up to an Atari VCS, and the sounds from the tape recorder would activate what's on the screen. So he went to Coleco, and Coleco was coming out with their own Atari uh, VCS clone, which they called the Gemini. So they liked the idea, because they'll sell the, this tape recorder with the Gemini. And they called it the KidVid voice module. Ralph was very unhappy with it, because one, it looked like a standard tape recorder you could buy anywhere. He wanted something that at least looked unique. And another thing, it was Odyssey uh, Magnavox all over again. Uh, Coleco was giving the impression that it could only be used with Gemini, not with the Atari. So that was it between the relationship between Ralph and Coleco. And Ralph went on to, he never released anything else uh, for video games. He did work on other stuff. He worked on an exercise bicycle that hooked up to an Atari VCS, so when you play racing games like Enduro or Pole Position, you're pedaling, that would activate the cars, but it never came out. Another thing he was playing with was a camera controller for the NES. Uh, it's the only, that's the prototype, it's the only one that exists. Looks like the NES controller on the, the back of it looks like an NES controller. Plugged into an NES controller, but it's a dummy, it did nothing. He had the idea, but he couldn't think of a way to, to utilize it. Now, the reason I'm talking about Ralph, I had a personal relationship with Ralph, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. I met Ralph at the Consumer Elect uh, Electronic Show, CES, in 1983. I was a young guy, I got into the show wearing a retail badge, I recognized Ralph, I went up to him, I said, you're Ralph Bear, and he looks at me, he goes, yeah, so what? <laughs> and so I crawled away with my tail between my legs and I'm thinking, what's wrong with this guy? Why is he so gruff? Anyway, in 1994, like I said before, I wrote the first history of video games called Phoenix, Fall and Rise of Home Video Games. And then two years later, oh, you can't even see it, I got a letter from Ralph asking how can he get this book. So. He had his address on there, and I said, well, this is Ralph Bear. I sent him a book. Never heard from him again. So I said, what is wrong with this guy? And then about six months after I got his letter, the second edition of my book came out. This was in December of 1996. So I said, well, I'll just mail Ralph a book. So I mailed it to him. Never heard from him. 
And then finally, around the spring of 1997, he contacted me. He had a summer home in Delray, Florida, which he, I mean, he had a winter home in Delray, Florida. So when I sent the book to his home in New Hampshire, he never got it until he returned in the spring. So he invited me up to his house. So I went up in the summer of 1998 in my brand new Honda Odyssey to meet the guy who invented the Odyssey. And uh, I was writing for a magazine called Electronic Gaming Monthly, which at the time was the number one video game magazine around. And I told my editors I was going up to visit Ralph. Now at the time, by that time, people did not know who Ralph was anymore. His name faded. He always kept in the background. His customers came first. So when Nolan Bushnell would say he invented video games, Ralph said, well, he's a licensee. He just kept his mouth shut. So he was forgotten. So I wrote the article for Electronic Gaming Monthly. It came out in uh, January of 2000. It's called The Bare Essentials. It was a seven-page article. It really went into detail. And all the people in the industry read it. And now, all of a sudden, they know who Ralph Bear is. At that point, he started getting invited to uh, give talks. He was given awards. Uh, he got a winner. He became the Hall of Fame uh, in the Computer Museum in Montana, which Steve Jobs awarded to him. And this finally culminated on February 13, 2006, when President Bush gave him the National Medal of Technology. And he had voted for President Bush, so he was happy about that. <laughs> what you can't tell in this photo is his wife passed away three days before this picture was taken. So it was unsure if he was even going to go. Kept a, a friendship for years after that. Uh, in 2006, around this time, he gave uh, his papers and the brown box to the Smithsonian. Then he started making reproduction uh, brown boxes so other museums could have them. And mine was the first of the reproductions, the one that's sitting out there. Uh, he was upset because the Smithsonian never put it on display. And for years, he, he complained about that. Oh, I gotta say, when uh, I met him, his wife told me, I told him the story, of, his wife the story about, you know, you're Ralph Bear, and he goes, so what? And she goes, that's the way he is. He doesn't consider himself a big shot. So that was just his personality. But anyway, so Smithsonian had it. They did nothing with it. I last visited Ralph in June of 2014. And at that time, Smithsonian was finally going to put it on display, and Ralph showed me all the plans, how it was going to look, and he was excited. He couldn't wait to go see it. Then, around September, I talked to him on the phone, and his health started to decline. And he told me that he didn't think he was ever going to see the, the display. And that's the first time I ever heard him being negative. He was always such a positive person. And then on December 6, 2014, he passed away at the age of 92. And then six months later, the Smithsonian finally put it on display. That's his lab on display at the Smithsonian. Uh, the following year, in 2016, the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York, they put another display of his lab from Delray, Florida. And that's my story of Ralph and video games. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>